actually move the microphone so you can be heard too. I mean, if you know. Okay. If you know. Here. Well, this is. I think this is really for the taping more than yeah, for us. Yeah, oh, if it is, okay. then don't yeah. worry about it. But yeah. you still want to be heard. Anyway. Okay. Oh, sure. Sure. Well, does that change your? Does that change what you're doing? Okay. Okay. Um. Okay. Well, uh, welcome everybody um, to the first. A dialogue in the series Fires in the Li Fire in the Library, Fires in Your Mind. Um, my name is Eugenia Butler. Um, uh, David Anton is here. John Paul is here. Um, uh, uh, this is part of an ongoing class that I'm teaching at, uh, here at, 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 at SciArc. I want to say to my class members that there is um, reading, there's three pieces of reading which are group down at the corner there. There's uh, um, a, a, um, a piece by David, a, a piece out of a, a book of David's called um, something avant-garde. I'm blanking right now. What it means to be avant-garde. Avant business at this point. Um, and again, I just want to welcome you all. Thank you for coming with us on this uh, new journey. Um, and I think we should just start. Um, uh, the form, or basically, this is uh, this is jazz. We we don't know <laughs> where, where we're gonna go. We don't know where we're gonna go. Uh, um, I think probably what we'll do is just just start talking and start playing. And uh, John and, and and David have been conversing a lot, uh, so I think that there's gonna be a real. We've got some territory to 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 mine. I'll come in with any questions or anything if I, if it feels appropriate. And if someone has something that, that a burning desire that they want to bring in, I, I think that you should do it. I mean, with, this is the first of this. It's a very experimental class here at SciArc. I am delighted uh, to be here at SciArc and very impressed at the support and the level of, 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 of competence and excellence that I'm surrounded with here. So um, thank you all for being here. Let's John, you were going to. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Well, I'm, I'm very happy to be here because uh, I uh, bring a lot of questions to my work that uh, I often run into a dead end with, with my colleagues because uh, everything I work with is considered to be ancient and therefore dead. I think we're going to have to. Well, no, Can that's we move probably up a little right. bit? Why don't we go up closer? Because yeah. I don't think it's going to be what I hear too. Okay, I was thinking. These mics are not. These mics are not helping anybody hear anything. So I think okay. we better talk. About that's what oh, I mean. Okay. They're not liking the rules. I'll just side. talk louder. Then. So we'll just. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll just yeah, the, really, the, the, the purpose for getting us up higher is so that we can project out. So. Yeah. If. Uh, so. Um, uh, as, as I was saying, so I uh, look forward to this experience because uh, I don't. I rarely have a chance to talk to somebody who deals with uh, poetry, with narrative. Um, in, in its active sense as, it, as it's used today. Um, the only thing we can deal with with ancient art, pre-Columbian art, are maybe fragments of poems or a few things that were jotted down by the Spaniards uh, in, the, in the 16th or 17th century. Um, and I also uh, wanted to start out by asking a few, a few questions about how you got interested in the field that you're in. You're in too. Can everybody hear at this point? Are we no, no they, we're a little bit they, more. Um, well, the mics are only mic for the sound. Well, we I'm thinking. Them, if we put the mics there, we could move up to the edge of the. We could take the table away, which we don't need. We could move up to the edge Let's of the table. Let's do that. Can we do that? So Will that every, work? We would be closer to everybody. It's also closer, I think. We're less yeah, separated. Right. Which is one of the things that we're looking for here. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I imagine for not only. For are, you in, are you in the holder? For John, for me together, I, I basically, in a sense, should be describe in a way some of the reasons why I find it so extremely interesting to be talking to uh, someone who's interested in ancient Aztecan or uh, ancient Mayan texts or, uh, as a contemporary poet. Because as a poet, uh, I, you know, I basically as a poet was inspecting the situation of poetry in America and in Europe uh, at the time I guess back in the 60s, early 60s, or even the late 50s when I was a kid, kid, and it seemed to me that there was a kind of narrow frame, a very narrowness in what was considered poetical, or what, what was considered kind of creatively meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, we were at the end of what I would call a modernist moment, 
and it had declined very significantly. And the, what was a great experimental movement in modernism at the, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century uh, had contracted uh, to a kind of very narrow space. And a number of us, uh, a lot of us, I mean, I was hardly the only one, Jerome Rothenberg, a friend of mine, a poet friend of mine, and I were wanted to relook at like what would be po the, what would be poetic traditions of a more universal level. In other words, why should we look at like what was standard European fare uh, from the Renaissance forward and then revolt against it? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it seemed to me that that was essentially the format of modernism was a kind of revolt against a fairly narrow set of ideas about what was literary and aesthetic excellence. So we became interested in non-Western materials. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought that by being outside the frame, they might offer different ways of looking at poetical construction, narration, and in a sense, that led us back in 65, um, Jerome Rothenberg and I edited a magazine. We started a magazine called Something because we didn't want to give it a name. We figured it would be something. And actually, the magazine began with two things. It began with a manifesto by me. Actually, it ended with a manifesto by me. And it began with a, a selection of Aztec definitions from the Florentine Codex collected by Saigon and translated for any Anderson Dibble translation. Uh, we didn't want to go retranslate. We thought they were brilliant enough. And we took the definitions because they seem to us to be powerful poetic st statements of, of people trying to represent themselves. Yeah. There were definitions of? There were definitions of a mushroom, uh -huh. a mountain, yeah. a, a cave. pathway, a cave, uh -huh. uh, things that you would think, I mean, for, I'll never forget the definition of a mushroom. It was supposed to be that it's round, like a severed head. Yeah. Yeah, that was, right. It struck me that that thing meant something different. It struck me that that meant something different. <laughs> then and now. Yeah. So there were the mountain was like a narrative. Yeah. The mountain was like a narrative. It's you know hard, stark, steep, mm -hmm. rocky, yeah. dangerous, open, airy, dark, light. It was filled with wonderful contradictory passages. Mm -hmm. It seemed as if it was a traversal of the mountain. Mm -hmm. It seemed like a narrative traversal was being offered instead of a standard definition, and it seemed like a brilliant solution to the idea of communicating experience, which had great poetic power. Yeah. As opposed to, as, I mean, you said, as, as opposed to a standard definition being in a Western frame. Well, you know, a protuberance from the ground, topographically. Okay. So, be, so, so, you know. so, so conceptually, it would be a, right. a, a, a terrestrial a, pimple. Now, if you describe it as a terrestrial <laughs> pimple, it's sort of energetic, but uh -huh. you know, still, it's you know. It, the mountain experience is somewhat greater yeah. in, in the Aztecan uh, uh, tr tradition, and all of them were. And we were totally struck by the need, by, by the, the brilliance of the attempt of these Nahua-speaking aristocrats uh, talking to a Spanish Franciscan, trying to communicate what to them was real experience and what to him must have been fairly remote, mm -hmm. as they wondered why he wanted to know what everybody already knew. Mm -hmm. So how do we explain what these mm -hmm. things are? Yeah. Anyway, that's how I kind of got into it back, and I guess it was about 64 or so yeah. uh, when we got into that. And it, of course, we met Dennis, and Den Dennis Tedlock and Barbara Tedlock, too, uh, who was working on SUNY. At that time, he was working on Sunni Indian tales, mm -hmm. and it seemed that the relationship to narratives of non-Western sources were radically avant-garde uh, in their, they, they seemed to share with the avant-garde a kind of sense of a broader set of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I used the word avant-garde then in a somewhat more positive way than I might use it now, but it, it seemed basically that we were looking for broader framework yeah, yeah. No, I, I uh, well, actually, I, I uh, uh, share those interests a lot, um, but in sort of, in, in another way, um, but related way. I uh, actually got interested in studying this material from a background in theater, not in, in archaeology or anything. Um, <clears throat> what happened was that I uh, grew up in Minneapolis, and uh, Tyrone Guthrie came to town and put this theater down the street from where I lived. And I got to go down to this theater. And I was used to going down to the Gopher Movie Theater and seeing the Kirk Douglas 
with his swords and things like that, which is pretty cool. But when uh, Hume Crone got up on that stage as Richard the Third, I uh, I was like ten years old, but I just this guy was spitting in my face. <laughs> he was going around in this humpback like this, and I was just mesmerized. And um, later had the opportunity to work on the the staff to make masks and helmets and things like that. And it was at that point that I knew I was never going to satisfy my career interests unless I put archaeology together with this interest in theater. So uh, I started out working in French Lower Paleolithic archaeology, but I found that, well, all we've got to work with here are a few skulls and some <laughs> broken rocks. Uh, and so uh, I was hard pressed to figure out how to put these two uh, driving interests of mine together. And um, that's when I uh, first found this, well, it came out as a Dover edition. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it as an art book, right? It's called yeah. the Codex Zusch Not All. And uh, this is actually a, a, an Austrian photo facsimile of the original. Uh, it shows you its original context, which is not really as a book like the Dover edition. It unfolds uh, as a kind of a, a screen or an accordion. Um, oh, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Why don't you maybe slide that Sure, let me pass it around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, open it up and maybe yeah. slide it through. And sure. Open it. Um, well, when I, when I found out that, in fact, we, didn't, we knew how to kind of decipher the dates and the names and things like that, but actually had no idea who the people were or where they were from or, or even how, why this thing is made like this instead of a book, I, I just became tremendously excited. <clears throat> um, when I got to UCLA, the, I was enrolled in an archaeology program, but the first course I signed up for was animation because I wanted to figure out how to bring these things to life. And uh, it was then that I um, began to uh, look at style and form in these codices. And uh, <clears throat> the characters are all big heads, little hands. I mean, they're just like Disney characters. Well, these are some of the most sophisticated people in, in you know, this is, a, this is a high civilization, so what's going on here? Why are they, I, my mind was filled with all of these wonders of like, well, how come they're children, how can they be children and empire builders at the same time? Um, also, this whole emphasis on di, uh, this diminutive stuff of, of shortening the features, making them, well, this basically looks like somebody related to Bart Simpson. Uh, and even the format, I began to get the idea was more like a, an animation storyboard. So by then, I was hooked. That was it. I was going to uh, apply all of this to, uh, to interpreting these codices. Unfortunately, uh, most people in archaeology or in art history have no devices or, or field of inquiry for asking or even answering these kinds of questions. So uh, through this long odyssey, this is how I've gotten into this, started to study it, and then now I'm talking to you as a, a poet. Can you, can you describe a little bit of your process of how you went from seeing this Dover book to 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 uh, uh, um, to being here? I mean, yeah. it's a, kind of a, I, I'm curious about the the sense of of, of uh, David described you as as, as a very as, as a very radical mind to be able yeah. to to to, do, to to make this interpretation, and I'm very curious as to what the the memes were that you used well, to, along the way? The big question that I was, when I got into my graduate program, the first thing I was told was that this isn't writing, that this represents a decline in literacy of Indian people of Mexico after a great legacy of my hieroglyphic writing. And uh, being a, a television nut since I was born, I, I and, and also not being a great reader. I, I was never a, an outstanding reader or, or in school or anything. I, I loved movies and television. I loved theater. I began to wonder whether this is really true. And also, it doesn't make any sense that people, civilizations, forget how to write. And so I began to wonder if this isn't an, an intentional choice after a certain period of time of people engaging in cartoons to bridge some kind of gap between them. You know, I mean, one of the problems I found in the history, I, I got involved in the history of literacy as one of the major problematics because I was finding that literacy itself was in many ways for poetry a very problematic drawback. Yeah. 
that literacy and, and poetry were not coextensive. That there was, I mean, it is fairly obvious that the great Western epics were not literary. Mm -hmm. That is, Homer never wrote anything. Whoever, he, whatever mm -hmm. blind man it was who wrote, who composed those poems, or whatever group of people edited them, they were clearly an oral, devolved from a completely oral tradition. Now, the Homeric epics have always been described as so sophisticated they couldn't have been constructed without writing, because people have mm -hmm. a fantasy that you can't improvise in a complex way, mainly because the people who did it never heard, never heard Charlie Parker. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in fact, the, the, the problem is it was a different cultural environment that made this commentary about literacy. There's an excessive commitment to the belief of literacy and literacy's value. <laughs> but in the history of discussions of literacy, it's fairly obvious, I mean, that all of the scholarship shows that there is very early literacy in Crete. Mm -hmm. But it's not literary literacy. Yeah. It's bookkeeping. Yeah. By and large, literacy was not used for literary events. It was regarded as a slave, a slave activity. It was low class. No. Uh, mm. That is, slaves wrote because they had to be bookkeepers. Yeah. Uh, I don't have anything against bookkeepers, but they did. That is to say, scribes wrote. Scribal literacy is, is again, it's low class. People didn't really, didn't really, yeah. you know, write literary things. So the question is, what did they do with literary things? Mm -hmm. They were undoubtedly oral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is, their literary culture was oral. Liter the use of literacy for literary purposes is extremely late in Western European culture. It doesn't really probably show up. According to Eric Havelock, who I think is probably the most reasonable figure on this, uh, you don't ever hear of anybody reading silently in, even in the Greek tradition till the very end of the fifth century BC. In a, in a play by mm. Euripides, somebody is reading something to himself. Yeah. Before that, you almost always have people <coughs> speaking, and sometimes there's somebody holding a text. There's a sixth century uh, Greek, uh, uh, Greek vase painting that shows somebody holding something and somebody else either listening or speaking. It has generally been misinterpreted as this person is reading aloud to this other person. Mm -hmm. Recently, it's been re-examined, and the belief is that a slave is holding a text and listening to the person who is reciting aloud, who is not looking at a text. He's listening to see that the other one is following more or less a pattern that seems appropriate. It's sort of the coach. The prompter is there, sitting there. So in effect, I think the whole question of literacy has been a great mistake mm -hmm. in its discussion. What, who was the character in Euripides? The, the I'm trying to remember who it was, but someone on board of a ship is mm -hmm. looking at it. I don't remember mm -hmm. that. And it's, that's the first citation mm -hmm. of silent reading, mm -hmm. of reading to oneself in the Western European tradition at all. Mm -hmm. And that comes, you know, 400, uh, 400 BC. I mean, it's, it's sort of like 405, something like that. Uh, it means all that time they got around without it? No one ever said the Greeks were not unsophisticated, well, uncivilized, but they weren't literate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this brings up an interesting discussion. Um, uh, David just told me that he had been longtime friends with uh, Dennis Tedlock and Barbara mm -hmm. Tedlock, who wrote this book, The Popol Vuh, if anybody's read their translation. And um, at a recent conference, uh, Dennis presented an idea about these Maya monuments with these texts on it that, that my colleagues always hold up to me as like the greatest achievement of, of the Indians of Mexico and Mesoamerica, whereas I'm stuck with these car lowly cartoon books. And uh, he came up with a very interesting idea, which uh, although he had discussed the fact that the texts are actually very limited in Maya, um, they may not be something that is to, to, to be read or uh, or even, it, it is a record, but not, not kind of read like a text. Nobody walks up to the monument and starts to, to read it. His idea is that it is putting in stone a ceremony and that the words keep the ceremony going. So you have the words and a dancer. And that in their minds, when they have completed a, a ceremony as people and leave, the monument carries the ceremony on. Mm. As, as a symbol it makes a lot of sense. until they come back, until it is time to redo that ceremony or honor that person. It makes a lot of sense if you think of grave writing. Uh -huh. You know, there's the famous Greek inscription. I, you know, my training was originally in Greek and Latin languages, so, but, so it's, I don't, they never got to the Aztecan. But yeah. in any case, there's a, there's a Greek inscription 
uh, that is that it, or a poem that's supposed to be read as if it were placed on the grave at Thermopylae, mm. where, the th where the 300 Spartans held the ground against thousands of Persians, oh, yeah. and they all died. Mm -hmm. And there is this poem which reads as if it were spoken by somebody dead. And what it says is, tell them back in Sparta, we rest here obedient to their command. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, that the event kind of, through the invocation of the It marks the, the words, voice of the dead. The voice yeah, of the it, dead, yeah. It, it marks the voice of the dead speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, we've died here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like a wake, it's like a Brian Donnelly in a movie called Wake Island, yeah. you know, <laughs> sort of like being overrun, so to speak, by the Japanese oh, right, as yeah. his bullets, the last bullets of his machine gun are gone, yeah. and he's overrun by hordes of imaginary you know, right, Japanese, by given the racist moment of yeah. the time, uh, and you imagine the voice of the dead machine gunner speaking, and the words are there largely, mm -hmm. to, as it were, evoke the spirit of the dead. So, I mean, my sense is it's not like, the, I mean, I think I, there's a lot of reason for believing the texts were not used specifically for reading, or like curses on graves. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's what's coming out, and then in fact, the, what, what, what Maya literature even is, is oral. It's not, it's not writing. Writing is something that is something else. It, 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 they're, they're, I mean, it's, 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 it's connected, but it's not so integrally connected as what we have writing for today in terms of its usage in history and narrative. Well, it obviously is, uh, the writing has spawned mm -hmm. from religious mm -hmm. stories, the need to document mm -hmm. dynasties, kings, but it's always in the context of a dance. If you actually look at those guys, they're often like got one foot up, and that's a stomp dance. So I mean, the, um, in almost 90% of the cases of those great Stella of a king, he's standing there dancing in, in perpetuity with this text around him that is, that is his text. Um, and so I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is that they, they we always thought that they had hundreds of thousands of books. Well, they did have lots of books, but it turns out that most of those books are probably for record keeping. Only in some of these great uh, kind of literary masterpieces that a king might make are, and in fact most of those are pictorial or what, what we think is, is the real literature of not only uh, these post-classic peoples, like the Aztec and Mishtec who made these, but even the Maya themselves. Well, this goes all the way around. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, I, I had a kind of theory that people have thought was harebrained, but actually, is people beginning, classicists beginning to think it may be the case. I had suggested to a number of friend classicists that I made a very consulting suggestion. You know how everybody talks about the fact that all these Greek plays were lost? Um, yeah. In you know, the old libraries. You know, we have 75 yeah. Greek mm -hmm. tragedies, the Greeks had been writing tragedies right. for over a hundred years. Yeah. There had to be nine, there had to be every year, for a hundred years, there had to be 12 plays that would more or less stand every year as the winners. Yeah. Now if you add the winners and the winners alone, <laughs> you have 1,200 plays. Yeah. If you count the losers as some rather large number, that larger than the 1,200 winners, we've lost thousands of Greek plays. Yeah. I felt very bad about this. I think only 75 out of thousands of Greek plays, and I began to think about this for a while. I began to think, and I realized, like, in 600, the Archon had to make the choice of all the plays that were presented as to which were the best plays to read, which trilogies were the best. He had to read a lot of plays. But Archons were not literary. Mm -hmm. Archons couldn't read plays. What are archons? The, the leader of the country was not going to be literate. He was an aristocrat. No. What would he be literate for? Mm -hmm. There was no reason in the year 600 for an archon to be able to read. Mm -hmm. His slave would read. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought about it for a moment. But actors are lower class. Mm -hmm. Actors could read. An actor might be able to read a text. But imagine, the playwrights were all actors. Mm -hmm. What the playwrights did is the playwrights made a proposal to the National Endowment. <laughs> it was like you went to the Archon, you were making a proposal to the National Endowment, and what you did was a treatment. You know, you came in, you gave them a chorus. The Archon said, I like that, that's it. You know? So I just saved all these plays. There were no 12,000 Greek plays. They didn't exist. They were only treatments, you know? And they were oral presentations. There were no 12,000 yeah. Greek plays at all. What's the, what is the form that they were preserved in? They weren't preserved. They were, That's why they weren't preserved. Well, the 75. The 75. The 75 were found in uh, 
obscure libraries resulting from the dis dissemination from the Alex great Alexandrian library. Yeah. Almost all of the sources seem to have been Alexandrian mm -hmm. of the 75 that were, that, that were found. Mm -hmm. And some were found in various other places and they were random. You know, you know why this, the, mm -hmm. the library at Alexandria perished. Mm -hmm. uh, probably because people were annoyed at the filing system. Somebody <laughs> probably burned it down. Uh, but the point of it is these things were found randomly. But the, you know, the illusion is that they have the 75 best. Mm -hmm. And it's not true. Yeah. There are many prize winning trilogies of which nobody has any record. There are prize winning, uh, th there are people who show up in platonic dialogues who are supposed to be the winners of the last, the, 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 you know, the last prize. Mm -hmm. No play of this person has ever survived. Uh -huh. So it seems rather startling that yeah. this is the case. Presumably, very far, far fewer plays were ever, were ever recorded in writing than the number that mm -hmm. supposedly were presented. And so one can imagine, yeah, there probably were 1,200, but there weren't 12,000. Mm -hmm. The ones that existed were the ones that were performed. Mm -hmm. And the, they were probably written down as a record, as a mm -hmm. recording, nobody nobody mm -hmm. needed to read them. Mm -hmm. They coached actors the way you the way you coach actors orally. I mean, the actors nobody read the parts. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were people composed orally. They coached orally, mm -hmm. and probably Greek theater was essentially an oral tradition, mm -hmm. an oral tradition that then got recorded. The way you keep records, mm -hmm. you know, they put it on file. This one won. It's on file. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and could so. I, could I interject sure. this point that uh, obviously Shakespeare's plays are recorded in the same way, merely as mnemonic devices, and people don't like to read Shakespeare; they only like to see the actual performance. Yeah. But I'd, I'd like to suggest that the way you're describing reading and writing is actually um, very, very recent, because even in my childhood in Europe, one of the things we were encouraged, in fact, forced to do, was to learn by heart. Yeah, great long passages of poetry, and yeah, people yeah. who knew the entire divine comedy by heart. And mm. In fact, the texts that were really important had to be heard. And in the evolution of the writings of Sylvia Plath, you know, Ted Hughes writes that from her early work where she was in the silent mode that I consider very recent, um, she evolved to a place where she was saying out loud everything that she was writing so that she could have the sound of words and language comes alive, of course, in the whole body and, and hearing of it. And I think that uh, everywhere where language has really mattered, this oral aspect of language cannot have perished. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I, I don't right. think that the Europeans like, had completely lost that sense at all. In mm -hmm. fact, you know, it, people are still storytelling and, and all of that is, it's, um, has continued. I just wanted to mention, although I, the Popol Vuh is absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. All these things that you and Rothenberg have done are essential, and we're all now just reveling in the in the renewal that we feel when we read things that, that are not from our past traditions. But still, if you read Anglo-Saxon kennings mm -hmm. or the, the poetry of, of Francis Pomange, for example, you have to admit that uh, everywhere, if you just want to start reading and going into areas that are unknown to you, the, the human spirit is similar that what you find in the Aztecs you may indeed find in, in, in your own tradition if you only took the time to, to read your, you know. I think it was just easier to find it there. Actually, sure. uh, Beowulf is an oral construction in Anglo-Saxon, uh, but even later, uh, well, there were two, obviously, the Shakespeare that you mentioned, uh, the texts that we have were dictated by actors uh, to somebody who took them down. I mean, there were no, I mean, there was no fair copy of a Shakespeare play. And as late as uh, the early 19th century, there were letters describing the way Wordsworth composed by walking outside and reciting it out loud and then memorizing what he had recited and then coming in and writing it down. Uh, so that in effect, I mean, if he didn't hear it, he, he, if he didn't hear it in his head, he couldn't write it down. Uh, so I think that while writing down has had a very interesting effect and it's changed in its meaning, and people can use it in very productive ways, poetry doesn't exist without an oral tradition. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may, writing may abet it or constrain it depending on how you use it, but any poetic tradition that exists really is probably an oral tradition. It has to be. As tale-telling narrative is an oral, an oral yeah. experience mm -hmm. primarily.
the writing becomes mnemonic, but then we begin hoarding all this in a way, and, and we lose the, the living quality of language. But well, I, was thinking, I was thinking of what, 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 what John was saying, though, was interesting. It seemed to me, remember he was, you were saying that, the, uh, that you objected to the notion of the loss of literacy. Yeah. And I think that you could push that further and say, not only wasn't it a loss of literacy, <coughs> that it could very well have been that this particular tradition recognized the limitations, certain limitations in literacy. Yeah. The literacy has, you, you know, like Socrates' famous lines in the Phaedrus where he talks, where he sets up an imaginary conversation between the Egyptian god who invented writing and, uh, and uh, one of the other gods, and the guy says, look, I've invented writing, it's going to save everybody all this trouble, and it's going to do all these writing, it'll keep there forever, and you can always get it back. And the other guy says, oh, he says, I don't know, he says, he says a, written, a written work, he says, is like the stupid child. It's the spoiled ch like the spoiled child of an indulgent parent. No. Mm. You know, mm. he says, what it does is it takes all this stuff by heart that it doesn't understand and it presents it to you. Mm -hmm. If you ask it a question, all it can do is repeat like a little parrot. No. Uh -huh. You know, in a sense, the text stays a text unless somebody can do with it. And this stupid child, you say, what do you mean by that? The child repeats the same statement over because the child doesn't know what it means. Yeah. So in a sense, it may be that the freedom of the literacy of this epic piece, mm -hmm. let's say the narrative that you've got, might have been felt to be freer in the mouths of the poets, the tribal poets mm -hmm. who spoke it, mm -hmm. because what was there were these Ed memoirs, these rich images, mm -hmm. out of which they could invent the pre precise language themselves. Yeah. Well, that's why I experimented with a storyboard idea, because you know when you take a class in film and, and they, they have each student uh, present his storyboard. Well, nobody ever presents even, well, even if you work for a film company or an advertising company, um, the guy who came up with the text didn't show up. And so what are we going to do? Well, Joe has to pitch it, you know? Well, it's never the same the same pitch. And I mean, you know, it depends on how much coffee you've had and how much you had to eat and stuff like that. And, and you know, when you're working in film or advertising, you know, millions of dollars can be at stake on these pitches. I mean, we see it in commercial advertising. You, you stop and wonder, God, I wish I'd seen the pitch on that commercial. You know, how did they, they get that one done? Um, and, and so I, I really wonder, I, I question because of my own presence in my own society with such an emphasis on literacy, how do they use a cartoon book to, to validate themselves? Of course, they are standing there with hordes of Kate's all plumes on and stuff, so I mean, they don't have to really validate their, their being. I mean, they are who they are. They can have people killed, they can do what they want. But uh, amongst their peers standing in, sitting in a court in which they're presenting this, is it, is it, is it through them sort of uh, understanding or approving of his style, his pitch, his, his uh, I mean, well, actually, th this is something I wanted to share with you, and I, I've got a copy of it here, but there are these um, Aztec poems that I mentioned uh, called the Cantares Mexicanos, and these were hundreds of poems that were found in an archive that were written by uh, Aztecs uh, right after the conquest. And there are some odd instructions in them in which uh, they, they talk about how so-and-so presents it better than, than, than another person. And they, even though they have written down all of these words, uh, they're, they're almost like descriptions of, of who are the legendary guys who could really present these better than other people. And, and the implication is that there is some kind of more open or, or freer form of the metaphors than just what is written in the text. Um, well, if you have it that wide open, what are the parameters for recitation? And, and you were talking about Charlie Parker, for instance. I mean, if, if, if you do open up your your pitch or your presentation, and you still have, I mean, is it, does it still have rhyme? Does it still have meter? Or does that vary upon each presentation? Are there poems that are given today in which they're not necessarily written down? They're just kind of? I certainly don't write anything down when I go in. I mean, you don't? I, I, may not be paradigm I may not be paradigmatic of a wide range of poets, but I, at, by 1972 or so, having been experienced composing ahead of time oh, yeah. and writing it. I got very tired of 
I got very tired going in and hearing the words that I had already put down come out of my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I found, well, I found it very boring. Well, it does. I mean, you go into a place, you've written something six years ago, uh -huh. you take the text out, and I'm going to have to be a slave to what I wrote six years ago. It becomes a big pain in the ass, you know, and I don't feel the same way. Well, you don't uh, feel that way about Shakespeare or someone else's. Well, yeah, that's their problem. Shakespeare could get tired of his own writing, and he probably changed it too. You see? He, he, he kept on writing. You You're know, right. He the number of times he, he has the same he material. Six years ago, he read what he wrote yesterday, or, or you know, whatever. He recycled a lot of material and comes out differently each time. I mean, I'm sure he felt himself free to mess with his own text, so I, you know, got tired <laughs> of it too. But I think there is an enormous, like, premium in this culture. It, it, it historically has been a premium in the image of the, the, of the hyper-complexity of, of that which is already fixed on, on the page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that it's any more complex than what you would invent any other way yeah. uh, if you're not constrained uh, by a kind of embarrassment about producing the thing at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. it seems to me jazz musicians mm -hmm. are a perfectly good example of somebody taking something, standing it on its head. It's a relatively familiar set of mm -hmm. chords, perhaps, in mm -hmm. a sequence of, a, of some pop tune and then it becomes some transcendent other thing in yeah. the hands of like a great jazz musician. You know, and it seems to me they're not afraid, they weren't afraid to go in and invent. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, poetry was like tight, very tightly constrained. And it wasn't always. There were periods of time mm -hmm. where it wasn't. So it seemed to me we should reinvent this moment. I don't, can't claim that I have a lot of people who are doing it, but I don't mm -hmm. care. I mean, I, I do it because I'm bored to do it the other way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I often write afterward uh -huh. from the text that I record mm -hmm. because I feel like it. But yeah. you see, I think that they wanted the, I think what you're doing about is a kind of sense of freedom. Yeah. You know, like these images are done to be mm -hmm. free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're not waiting. Kurt Forster, you know, the artist during Kurt Forster is an old friend of mine, and he was telling me a funny story. He said, listen, he said, there's a letter from Giulio Romano. Uh, that goes to this, it says, listen, the letter goes, I forgot who he wrote it to, he says, listen, he said, the iconographical program isn't here and the painting is three quarters finished. <laughs> you, think about what, you think about what that means? <laughs> you know, what exactly did the iconographical program add to it by the, with the painting at that point? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, and it seems to me that you're talking, what, what I think about is you're talking about these two sort of contravening systems in our, in our own culture right now, which is one, if something is printed, if it's written down, it's real, it's true. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I read it in the newspaper, versus which is kind of a standardized, smaller part, a, a larger part of the culture, maybe a smaller-minded part of the culture, versus the improvisational uh, Charlie Parker, I mean, maybe, maybe that's, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it well, paints a picture of almost being stuck, in a sense. Well, this brings up an mm -hmm. interesting point, and, and it's something that, that um, again, that came up in a discussion with Dennis Tedlock and a few other colleagues, and, and it's a little too far out for, you know, our archaeology and anthropology colleagues because of the interest in, I think mainly in showing that each culture has risen to the point of, of creating writing as if that was their, their ultimate goal, because that's our ultimate goal. And it comes up with this uh, idea of, a, of, a, of, of an open or more open or freer form of, uh, I mean, you have, you have the documentation, you have the pictures and things, but it's, it's in the presentation. And a couple of tips that came up about this was um, this incident with Moteku Zoma that I, I mentioned um, the, in, in the story of the uh, conquest of Mexico. Um, I think everybody kind of knows the basic outline that there was this great king of the Aztec Empire and that he was brooding and fearful because Cortes was going to uh, arrive and he was uh, the embodiment of this great god Quetzalcoatl come to take back his, his throne from the Aztecs. And um, continually, Motecuzoma was put in the position of going into a chamber where he was supposed to uh, conjure a dream or see into the future. And he continually would go into this chamber, and he was uh, would have these visions, but or he was supposed to have these visions, but he kept coming out and addressing his court and saying that he can't get the visions, and that this is what caused his entire uh, political interest structure to collapse was because they had no. Tr what what is actually going on here? And I wonder whether it wasn't that they did not see the validity in his presentation of what they expected him to say, or that there was some, it was like somebody getting up there and playing some bad jazz. I mean, you, you can tell 
when somebody, I mean, I know this sounds like a, a you know, a, a, a kind of a, a oh, I don't know the word exactly, but a, like from Indian movies when Indians are constantly talking in a stilted speech. But, uh, and we all know of great Indian oratory that was, that was given. Um, well, the fact of the matter is, is that, that is how Indian people um, judge whether somebody is speaking true or not, is through the presentation. And um, we, we wonder if even a state society like the Aztec can be run by government officials who are expert orators as well as having certain... But there's another fascinating part of that, which is the dream. I mean, I can't, yeah. I can't help but wonder if, 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 in sen if in truth he didn't see anything. You know, that, I mean, there, yeah. there's the precognitive dream. Right. And I mean, I know that, 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 that one of the ways I have of checking out a reality of saying, well, do, do I think this can happen is, can I see this? Can I see this happen in, 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 in front of me? And if I can see it, if I can picture it, yeah. then usually it can happen. Mm -hmm. But if I can't see it, well, then it's a, bl it's a blank wall. I yeah. mean, I wonder if that, that, wasn't, that wasn't perhaps part, I mean, I think it's fascinating that this Well, yeah, I think part of it is the dream and the other part is the presentation and that that, that, that is as critical mm -hmm. as, as what, what the, mm -hmm. the vision or dream mm -hmm. is. Maybe um, let me bring in here the difference between a shamanic experience and dogmatic religion where priests are supposed to simply uh, refer to the dogma, yeah. whereas Native American people, each holy person, I, I, by the way, I'm Michael Klassen, and I'm a faculty member here, and Michael told me I should come here tonight. I'm here. Oh, <laughs> I have a big mouth. Oh, well, that's all right. <laughs> and Michael said he, that we raved about yeah. you. I'm so glad you're yeah. here. I'm sorry, but you know, I teach literature. Right. Anybody right. wants to say yes. something, you're no, welcome. This is <laughs> valuable, John. Yeah. Yeah. Here, but, okay. but what you're pointing to is the sense of, of the individual having a connection to the power, which poetry is also, and it comes out of your mouth, and just like in the flamenco at some point, everything takes off and you're in the mode where the energy is flowing as opposed to being a priest who has been to the seminary and studied for 10 years mm -hmm. and has had to understand exactly what he is or she might be allowed to say. It's, mm -hmm. it's that different sense in the culture of a living, creative ability. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good point. The problem anthropologists have with that is that you don't, they, they have never heard of societies that are run by shamanic statesmen. Um, they, they, they don't know how to deal with that kind of well, thing. I'm afraid Hitler and Stalin are a couple. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, actually, that's a very good point. And, yeah. and, you're, and it's, you're talking about personal charisma and things like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you're actually talking about the difference, the same thing, the, 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 the inner dream and the outside presentation. Yeah. I mean, you're Hitler talking is about that presenting dreams, yeah, yeah. and things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John, uh, real, real quick. Wasn't it predicted that the empire was going to collapse? And wasn't I mean, wasn't he working against that? That that, yeah. that all the force of history said that that as soon as they come, everything that and didn't the calendar end when uh, Monte, when uh, he he came? So he had all that stuff in back of him, and I wonder he couldn't dream. Well, that's 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 part of it. Uh, well, to, on the first part of that, we, we've now pretty much figured out that it wasn't the Aztecs of downtown Tenochtitlan who were so interested in Quetzalcoatl. It was all of the kingdoms they had conquered uh -huh. for the last hundred years that were dedicated to Quetzalcoatl. So what, when they heard that there was an alien offshore, they sat around and went through the books as fast as they could and went, there he is, that's the guy we need, and here's the date. And so they're self-fulfilling a prophecy by sort of, it's a, it's a fundamentalist movement by their, the, an insurrectionist movement. Remember, Cortez went into Tenochtitlan with 500 men. He had 50,000 Tlaxcalan Indians behind him. So the reality of this is that this is a, an Indian war against an Indian nation. It's not, you know, so, so this, is a, this is fundamentalist kind of thought, coming up with the right prophecy for the right guy to get rid of this, this yoke. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How terrifying and, yeah. contemporary. Um, and, and there is this other fact, which is that these guys are politicians. So if they're going to bail on this particular administration as well and leave Motecuzoma up the river without a paddle, they can easily kind of say, well, it's really a bad round of jazz we had on that one kind of a thing. But at the same time, this is the, <laughs> the, the master of the known world at the time. This is the Julius Caesar of oh, his time. I have so, a question. Yeah. You know, I've heard about the Florentine Codex. Yeah. You know, I've seen this, seen it, but I've never investigated why it was done. What was it made for? Does anybody Do you, know? 
Did you read up on that? I, I have a few I, the ideas. Impression, the, I, the impression I had, I mean, well, in the, in the, the impression I have is that the that a great deal of this information was was assembled with respect to the feeling of a crumbling a crumbling scene. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in other words, that uh, these people were being literally with well, a documentary essentially well, of their lifestyle. It was an attempt to or their to, history, it was, or something like somebody. I, I don't know it was what it was. It was a recovery. Was. So what, it was okay. Are you to what it was? I think it's a kind of recuperative yeah. attempt to reco recuperate yeah. the meanings and values. Oh, that their lives were filled with. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like the Christian. Movement. At the end, yeah. at the end, at the scene, <laughs> a, a scene where they were facing what I think, in some sense, they recognized as the end. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it was a sense like a testament. Yeah. So there is, I think, that's the feeling one gets from it. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll just say say briefly that, uh, yeah, um, uh, when Cortez went into this project, uh, he had two choices of who to take in with him, Dominicans or Franciscans. And the Pope assigned the Franciscans because he knew the Dominicans were just going to start in on anybody that they ran into with Inquisition and all kinds of other stuff. Franciscans, being sort of naturalists by theology, uh, were assigned to this project in order to kind of um, both identify what the parameters were of paganism and to document it, which they were so good at. So this one friar, um, Saha Gun, was uh, assigned to, he, he was the first one to kind of get in there, and he um, worked with the Indians. He didn't write his own kind of version of what, what he had heard from stories. He worked with Indian people themselves, and this is where this came up that David was talking about. He would ask an, an informant, describe a mushroom for me, expecting a sort of, well, as you pointed out, either a biological or, or functional interpretation, and hardly expecting to get back. It's like a decapitated head. Well, that's so, <laughs> so, they were a very militaristic society. Right? Yeah, they were. Yeah. And so it was interesting. Why would they, anything that seemed like they would write anything down would only be for to, 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 to deify themselves or to glorify with their actions. It's mm -hmm. sort of very much like the Egyptians. <coughs> yeah, that isn't, that isn't, that's one example that, that does obviously refer to decapitation. The mountain, of course. on the other hand, yeah. the cave. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a different it's metaphor. Not metaphor. Metaphor. It's, it's not all military. <laughs> I mean, it, it seems to me that you're dealing with a uh, uh, I mean, they may have been militaristic and terroristic and yeah. whatever else they were, but the uh, the particularly in the definitions mm -hmm. and, 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 and some of the other things, they're more institutionally uh, correct. Uh, one may use the word I see for institutionally correct <laughs> <laughs> instead of politically correct. For them. So some of those works are more institutionally correct. Yeah. Uh, but in the definitions, you're in a freer form space. Mm -hmm. What you're getting is Sargon is asking them questions we don't know what questions he asked. But he's asking them what are generally seen to explain what certain things are. They're among the commonest things there, certain kinds of birds, a mountain, terrestrial phenomena. Uh, it's curious which things were in fact asked and, and which and, things. And you don't really know who he was asking. N well, you kind of, there were, I, I mean, the, the literature mean, suggests he was asking aristocratic Aztec okay. informants. Uh -huh. okay. uh -huh. And uh -huh. Aztec noblemen, okay. people primarily. Rose. People who had like, right. you know, knowledge of the elite culture that it was. Not the servants. The odds are very strong that he was essentially dealing with an elite group. Did, did he also ask about, ask about structures? Did he ask about urban, the cities? Or was, were they more naturalist kind of, kind of questions? He seemed to have a very good tact of a great ethnographer. Yeah. Not to, not to overdefine what he was asking uh -huh. and let them take their play, their, take up the space their own way. He seemed to, by intuition, be a great ethnographer. Mm -hmm. Well, we, they call you know in anthropology they call him the first ethnographer. Yeah. I mean, he's like really a great one. Mm. What is it? What is a great one? I don't. A great know. one is somebody who can listen, uh -huh. but also yeah. can get somebody else to talk because they can listen. Mm -hmm. And Sargun could listen. Mm -hmm. It's obvious he was a great listener. And they were willing to talk and willing to write things down for him. And they did. And what you have is this incredible thing called the Things of the New World, mm -hmm. which is a very large body of work now that we have in the library in Spanish and in Nahua. And uh, some of which has been translated. I don't know if they do, do they think? They, they do the whole do thing, they, yeah. They, yeah. That it only had part of it, but I guess probably yeah. not so well done. In fact, there was a second edition. They went back and redid it after that. So in the 70s, that was finally wrapped. Or early 80s, it was finally wrapped. It must have been the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Can I ask you, do you know anything about narratives that were actually inscribed on, on strings with knots and could be read by the Indians? They could actually recite a long story by running their fingers down the string? Yeah, the, the uh, Inca, uh, their, their whole uh, system was uh, of recording was based on that. And that's been a major problem in 
looking at, at Inca literature or their devices because they did have vases with, with you know, scenes of pictures on them. A lot of these stories and things were invoked at drinking parties or, or you know, it's dinner theater, right? Um, but uh, <laughs> but the, 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 the quipu that you're referring to, um, there was a, a strong tendency to think that was only for numbers and things, uh, accounting. But uh, recently, there's been some evidence to suggest that this was for reciting a story like a rosary. Uh, you, you can get a narrative out of it as well. But um, as I understand it, nobody has been continuing to do kipu unless you heard of somebody well, in the hills. Well, the Maori that, also have this tradition of they have sticks. Yeah. And only certain people can read the sticks, and uh -huh. therefore they become the storytellers. Yeah. And that's, that's carried over from generation to generation. And it's. Uh, like a code, yeah. it's just a notch. Yeah. The notches tell them what to say. Well, this brings up the same question. I, I, I personally believe that any society can come up with a writing system and use it the way we do. It's not a question of primitive art or, or uh, lunacy or idiocy or, or simple not mindedness, but that there is a reason why they prefer to work in these systems. And and I wonder, as an as as an aesthetic or as a well, wh whether it isn't because of its openness, as you brought out. And I, in my own field, have no way of, of discussing this except to study more about how poets work in general and what their confines are by with writing. And so that's why I find it interesting to talk to David tonight. Well, actually, this is actually interesting in another sense, too, uh, that the use of, of kind of um, either idiosyncratic emblems or images with string, for example, the string figure work uh, that was produced in Australia by the Australian Aboriginal artists look like it's inherently narrative. Mm -hmm. That is, the tendency when it was first taken, I mean, that is, the, the people who collected it didn't realize that. And what they did is they would glue down the figures the, the, mm -hmm. in the museums and you'd see them. But actually, there are, are ethnographic accounts of great string figure artists uh, going, making, a, a great string figure artist was someone who could make very many images with string. Make, I mean, very complex ones. But the images themselves seem to be related to narratives, loosely to narratives of great ancestor figures moving across certain spaces. Mm -hmm. And presumably the figures played the role of essentially being, the, one can think of knots. It's possible to think of knots as images. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you, or you could think of an image as a node. In other words, if, if you think of an image as the node of intersecting, intersecting va values and meanings, that an image, in a, let's say even like a dream image, mm -hmm. think of a dream image as if it were a knot. That is to say, any dream image as if it were a knot made of, of overlappings and twistings and reversals of certain impulses. Mm -hmm. And so what you have is not one, not two. And you go from like situation one to situation two to situation three. The string figure artists of Australia seem to be at the end of a great tradition of these multiple you know, ways of imaging, which is story which evoked, either evoked, reminded, or encoded something. Mm -hmm. My the sense is probably it invoked stations within narrative, cruxes within narrative, rather than the full story. In other words, if you remember the crux of the narrative, you can tell the story a lot of ways. But the crux is really what's going to matter. Mm -hmm. You know, so in effect, if you can go from crossing to crossing, that's all you really need to be able to do it. So the object could become the crux of the matter, yeah. and then your interpretation, your ability to present it is what is judged. I would think so. At least that's the way I've come to start thinking about, well, the, about those things. I'd never thought of this like that before, and I think that's a fascinating uh, idea. Um, let, let, me, let me point out that, that the Mishtek brought these codices in continually, even though the, uh, they use, try to use them in land claims, because when their system of oracles for judgment and everything broke down, they started using the Spanish courts as, as their way of, of waging legal war with each other. And they, even though they were trained in Spanish writing, they continually kept bringing these books back in, which, now, if this is a book that's used for, for uh, as an epic poem for the recitation in a court at a drinking party, how does it suddenly, <clears throat> with the transition into colonial uh, time, suddenly become a legal document that <clears throat> is uh, presented as the validation of my claim to 
hundreds of acres in the south end of the valley. And, and a Spanish court was forced in many circumstances to have to look at the book and say, well, it, the, the character does seem to be marrying this character and he's got 25. So I guess we're gonna have to go along with it because this pre-Columbian documentation is better than your paltry uh, written inheritance will from your uncle Pedro kind of a thing. Um, the Spanish courts were actually arguing in favor of these things, even though they were not at that time then presented in this kind of storyboard format with this flowery speech of embedded metaphor you've talked about. Um, so obviously the object continued to take on, well, as you point out, the crux of the matter without, even though it, it then became separated from necessarily its, its metaphorical speech, and although that's probably what they were doing with it when they got back to the palace, in a Spanish court, it just simply represented what, you know. Yeah, the crossing points. The crossing points. It seems to be the crossing points. See, in a way, I mean, I had been working on, uh, when I, I've been talking about, I, I got into a reconsideration of narrative at a theoretical level uh, because I, like I said, I started from an impulse of like critiquing modernism, and, and modernism had two very definitive positions uh, that were hostile on the one hand to narrative and the other hand to representation. Oh. Mm -hmm. The two basic twin em e enemies of, uh, of modernism in the early 20th century, I mean, someone like Apollinaire who might write narratives would nevertheless have said the two things that are exhausted are narrative and, uh, narrative and representation. Actually, by the time we started looking around, the question became: Was it really? The, was that really? Was narrative exhausted, and was representation exhausted? And it becomes clear that what gets called narrative frequently in the West is a certain form of storytelling. And I've begun to rethink narrative as something other than storytelling. Hmm. That is, my sense is that narrative and storytelling are not the same thing. The narrative and story are related, but not the same. And I identified narrative quickly, just to quickly, I mean, it's a long theory, but I don't want to go through the whole deal. I just want to point out that I identified narrative as the, as the confrontation, or the representation of the confrontation, of a subject who desires something that is negatively or positively, you're afraid of something or you want it, with the possibility or threat or promise or threat and promise of some transformation. In other words, you're afraid, you want to become a, you're a beggar or want to become a king, mm -hmm. or you're afraid to be destroyed by the dragon or whatever, or you'll have to marry the witch or whatever, the, you know, you make to be, whatever the image, but it's a subject with something at stake. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that if that's the center, the way in which you represent it as a story, the struggle to either bring it about or abet it, is how you communicate it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. But we deal with this kind of conflict in dream systems, which are very, from the point of view of ordinary story form, are relatively disorderly. Yeah. But they're not, not intelligible at all. Mm -hmm. They're only disorderly if you have a very orthodox idea of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Or, it seems to me, storytelling can be seen as the other thing. Mm -hmm. Storytelling can be seen as the external shell of narrative experience. It's how you communicate narrative experience to somebody who doesn't know all the things that are at stake for your subjectivity. So you explain the circumstances. He was standing on the bridge. He was seven and a half feet tall. Uh, it was three in the afternoon. Uh, none of which, and you give it in an order of accumulating logic, which may not be necessary if, you're conf if the confrontations are what count for you. Mm -hmm. So in effect, you could scramble the order of virtually any narrative experience and still get the full narrative experience. And one of the places I found mm -hmm. this to be the case were in the Aztec definitions. Yeah. That is, the Aztec definitions have no storytelling whatever. Mm -hmm. There's an account of a cave that has, is filled with narrative experience. Mm -hmm. That is, the terror of the dark descent into the cave, the, the release of coming up into the light, the danger, the difficulty, all of these things are there. And they're in scrambled order. And you mm -hmm. can't tell, but you know what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. you're, dealing with the, you're dealing with a certain kind of confrontation that is very clear, and it's what get generated in great power, the way it might be generated in a dream, but not the way it would be generated in a story that you would tell to somebody else ceremonially. Oh, yeah. So the question I wanted to know was, in my, I came to a kind of Chomskyan conclusion that we do not develop narrative competence from hearing people tell stories. Narrative competence is grounded in our dreams. Mm. Anybody who dreams has narrative competence. Mm. 
Storytelling competence is developed socially. It's how you communicate narrative experience to others, and it's the core of what we mean. But we live on narrative. If we don't live on narrative, we don't have human personalities at all. On the other hand, you might be able to get by without stories, but you wouldn't get by without narrative. And it seemed to me that stories are interesting, but they're not the same. So it seemed to me so, that once you take this view, you split the modernist argument and say, yeah, yeah, they were mostly concerned with conventional stories and conventional representation, whereas the image nodes that I was talking about are also representational. Mm -hmm. And those image nodes are filled in modern, great modernist poetry of the Dadaists and the Surrealists. And they never found those problematic, and those were representational. Mm -hmm. They weren't orderly representations. They were representations of psychic clashes of meaning, mm -hmm. which, again, you can find in non-Western work, mm -hmm. specifically. Contrast mm -hmm. between fire and water, say, yeah. in some of the things that, like you, you mentioned, like when you mentioned the two gods, and, 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 and you know, the, the god, the, the water god, Valak, yeah, right. and the fire god, mm -hmm. Quisla yeah, right. you know, I mean, the conflict. These are like powerful forces. Which is also a metaphor for war and, and anything else. That, yeah, it's, you know, it's their form of physics, but, you know. How is it different from the physics? Uh, well, it, it has to do with physical forces and opposition mm -hmm. and, and describing those, but rather than describing them in technical jargon, it's used in terms of, of the metaphors of natural mm -hmm. natural experience or observation. So, well, would that imply then that the ability to uh, become a storyteller is a lot like the ability to make treatments? I would think, and much, the, I, and would think I would think is, it is probably so. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's very interesting. I uh, wanted to talk about bringing that up uh, context a little bit. Um, and that has to do with, with how, how this material is, is, uh, is kind of invoked. What is its architectural uh, environment and, and things like that. Um, you know, we, 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 we don't know exactly when or where these, these kings would get these codices out. We have one reference to the Mishtek stretching them out on walls. And that's where I got the idea of the storyboard, that somehow this guy is reciting a poem and it has something to do with that book. But is he sitting at a desk and turning the pages? No, we know that they put it out on a wall. Well, they talk about them performing them performing them, and, and uh, 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 doing them in these palaces. This is a little diagram of the, of the uh, palaces of Mitla. The architecture was very uh, uh, inspirational to Frank Lloyd Wright. He designed a lot of houses that, that had this basic format. Um, they're all, notice that they're all enclosures. They all are residences surrounding a central patio. Um, they all have these uh, mosaic uh, weaving designs in them. Weaving was a primary commodity to these people. They traded in blankets, basically. Um, beneath the palaces is where they put their highest ranking royal dynasty. These are the mummies of the guys who are in the codices. This is their house of Windsor, basically buried in the floorboards of one of the courts. Um, and then what I was interested in was continuing the storyboard analogy further so that the man himself, the poet himself, becomes a part of this, this, the iconography of the codex. So we have descriptions by the Spaniards that they wore clothing embroidered with the designs from the codices. He's drinking from vessels that have these stories on them. Uh, he's wearing jewelry that each jewel will tell part of a story. Um, and so when he gets together with the codex, with the wall painting, in the palace, standing above the ancestors, you have an entire pictographic network of material that is supporting his pitch, so to speak. And finally, this is the critical thing. Um, these vases are often decorated with flower and, and vegetational motifs. Well, these now turn out to be psilocybin mushrooms and morning glory. And cacao is what the basis, the, the, the fluids that they're drinking are. They mix all of this stuff together. So through that, they feel that they're actually talking to the dead while they are uh, presenting these and stories. And perhaps maybe talking to the dead. Well, to them, they're mm -hmm. talking to the mm -hmm. dead. And in Mitla today, they still continue mm -hmm. to talk to the dead. There are, are documented stories of men and women who go into the Mitla tombs to discuss inheritance claims with their families, with people in the tombs. So, which is which is which calls me back to what you were talking about earlier when you talked about the that the, this representation was a, a way was in a sense the the, the 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 performance or the the ritual went on 
in in this codices when the people when the performers left. It's a, in a sense, it's a way of playing with time. It's a, yeah. it's a way of escaping the linearity of, of the sequ sequential nature of of, of of how we perceive physical time. Well, it's very consistent with mm. an Indian perspective that events. It's it kind of reminds me of that weird tree thing again. Is the, is the tree? Can you hear the tree? Does the tree make a noise if it's one in the forest but nobody's there to hear yeah. it? Yeah. Mm. And these guys just feel that. They're on the outside. Trees are falling in the forest all the time, and they hear each other. We're kind of on the outside. We have the ability to go in and witness this place without time or space as we define it, and yet we have to come back out of it again. So they, to them, it almost appears that the the reality is in this other dimension, in a sense that they go that make themselves go into. And then, and then they're forced to come back out and make political decisions, religious decisions, social decisions. Is this the same place that... that, that it's that ecstasy, basically, which I've never quite understood what, what ecstasy is, but it's apparently, in, in a Greek interpretation, some state you go into when you are... But it's not just drink or something, it's also, isn't it related to poems and... and I'm well, sorry. Well, the is this shamanic. <laughs> They're uh, the same as the themes in the codices, marriages and, 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 and the passage of, uh, or their murders. These are very uh, Aeschylus-like or Shakespeare-like plays of murders, royal intrigue, and marriage. Um, they, they focus on usually two or three dynasties, and they end up with the last king who yeah, is... Yeah, like in so many others. Yeah, and, and I'm taught that they're narrative events with... I find this very interesting to talk to David because he's pointing out this, this split between narrative and storytelling yeah. because my field wants to see it all as just, well, it's their way of storytelling, only it's a very primitive device. But if you think of it as opening itself up to uh, narrative as David's defining it, it gives it a lot more uh, uh, personal expression on the part of the person who is employing the codex. Right. Yeah. A little at eight years ago, or 10 years ago, I, uh, I was shown a whole series of cloths embroidered in Vietnam oh. of the Vietnam War. Oh, uh -huh. And it showed all these lovely, these cloths were about, they were about six or eight feet square, and they had helicopters in them. Oh, yeah. They had bombs in them. They had the people in the village. They had the villagers. They, and these were the current events. Yeah. And this is how they recorded history. Oh. And it was real interesting because they were art pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And were and they wearing them as well? Or no, or they no? were actually made to hang on the wall uh -huh. or to use as a covering. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were considered. And it was very interesting to me because I thought, my lord, look at those. Is, is this a tradition in Vietnamese yes. uh, it's it's in the culture? Thai camps. That's Thai, what they yeah. did in the Thai camps yeah. when they were in China. Uh, they yeah. brought them to Long Beach and other places oh, where yeah. they left. Yeah. These the Hmong, the Lush. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. well, also the, women. Yeah. Also oh, right. the Af the Af the Afghani's in the in the carpets in the in the last I yeah. suppose uh, ten or fifteen years started putting in submachine guns sure. and tanks and and uh, it was current know, and it yeah. was their way of recording history. Mm -hmm. Well, so well that's where the word text comes from. The, the earliest texts were woven cloths yeah. and in Homer you have Penelope weaving into the shroud that she's going yeah. for her father-in-law the the stories. Is the text the text? What is what is the word text come? It comes from the weaving. Weaving. Yeah. Textile. Oh, I see. Uh, is, no, I is, is it a Greek word? It's a weaving term. Yes. It's a Greek. Uh -huh. yeah. um, in the Greek, it's a kind of weaving or building term. It can be used for both, but weaving, I think, is its intrinsic meaning. But there's another. Thing, I mean, like it, it's very. It's nearly universal because the American Indians in the mid 19th century we began finding a whole group of Indian things called winter counts, yeah. uh, in which what you have are these seeming recordings of history, again, recorded elliptically, and with Buffalo. salient images of, of events, right. which one yeah. would imagine they probably could recite the account of mm -hmm. very well. And you have these sort of buffalo hides, typically, uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, large hides, on which are these rather wonderful drawings. Oh, yeah. uh, like the famous one is the Jean-Baptiste uh, uh -huh. winter count. Uh, and you see them uh, dealing with their, it seems to me that the winter counts there have some phenomenon in common with the Vietnamese ones. Uh, the Indians seem to have a kind of anxiety of their destruction by the encroaching Europeans. And, and that it's a kind of attempt, well, yeah. Well, well, like yeah. I guess by then they had yeah. figured out that there was no way to yeah. get away from these demons yeah. and yeah. that they were being wiped out. And so in effect what you see is, the insidious way it moves from one thing to another to another thing on the on you know in the drawings, 
So they become kind of accounts of destruction, mm -hmm. I mean, which are, uh, you know, kind of very moving if looked at. But I guess there's a tendency to undermine what they mean by calling them winter counts. Yeah. You know, as if they were primitive calend calendrical events. Right. Uh, and they're not. I mean, they have a kind of great pathos, uh, a kind of like uh, poetic pathos that may have, as it were, generated orations and discourses of a great brooding melancholy that would accompany these things. But of course, the people who got them didn't know. No. Mm -hmm. I'm still not clear exactly what they are. What, what well, you have like a buffalo hide. Mm -hmm. And a buffalo hide, on the buffalo hide, are these wonderful drawings. Mm -hmm. And the drawings record salient events, mm -hmm. the, coming of the, the coming of the horse, okay, now I got it. Uh, yeah. smallpox, mm -hmm. a, a fight between two groups, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. running off with horses. And um, who would do these in the tribes? Indian. During the winter. Indians during, mm. the, during when the time they were in winter camp. Mm. Like mm. Mm. They, they draw them and they're wonderful looking Singular things. people would do them or anyone in the tribe would it do them? It looks as if individuals did them, but yeah. it's hard. Mm. It's not absolutely clear. Sure. It looks mm. as if an individual the one, the one saw, did it. Mm. Had, had soldiers on it. You know, I mean, cavalry soldiers mm -hmm. and buffalo hunts. Yeah. And it was a way of recording their life. Mm -hmm. And so that gets back to what you said, David, about narrative and history, you know. And so I was curious, I guess, what you said. The Mayan Codex was done as, let's say, the, uh, uh, right before their society was disintegrating, mm -hmm. a way of recording it. And so everything we've discussed so far has been a way of recording what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, actually the Popol Vuh, uh, uh, as Dennis Tedlock continually points out to everybody, uh, it, it says in it that it's an interpretation of pictures, I believe, right? It, 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 yeah. it, 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 whoever was writing it down was trying to, knew that the pictures were quickly disappearing. Friars are burning them, their legality was called into question in courts, things like that. And so this was a, an attempt by a Maya to, to turn it into or, or fix it. To hold on to To the hold on to it with, with Spanish writing. What I'd like, I mean, I'd go further and say that it, that seems to me its connection with human dreaming. Huh. Human dreaming, I mean, I, if you take even a Freudian argument, if one, if one universalizes Freud and gets away from like, the family romance, which Freud got driven out of his mind by. But I mean, in other words, if you take the dream as a meaningful recuperation against the problematic of loss. In other words, dreams almost always seem to be faced, you seem to be faced, all dreams seem to deal with a problematic. And in a way, the dream might be seen as the recuperative narrative the way the Indian buffalo count is, you're recuperating your life, uh -huh. Uh -huh. as it were. You're struggling to maintain more than your life. You're struggling to maintain yourself under the, under the threat of change. Change is coming for you no matter what happens. You're going to age. You're going to die. You're going to be whatever's going to happen. Everybody dies. I mean, in an existential sense, the world, the, the world, the life is essentially defined by the fact that we're all going to be changed. And we may be changed in drastic and frightening ways. Mm -hmm and one wants to resist it or transcend it. And one might imagine that dreams are generated in the th by the same kind of threat that Jean-Baptiste winter count is. The Indians were gonna be annihilated, you're gonna be annihilated too, but you're gonna be annihilated differently. Mm -hmm. Maybe not by the white, the white European, but by the world that is, as it changes, mm -hmm. uh, by the Republicans. Who knows what you'll be annihilated by? <laughs> you know, the point is that the point is that dreams may be operating in exactly the way these narratives operate. Mm -hmm. When you're up against the wall of anxiety, yeah. the dr narrative is what op what becomes the operative way of connecting the pieces together. Uh, almost like the text, like the the, the old. It's almost. I'm, I'm struck by the. The, I mean, it's, 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 it's text, it's weaving. I mean, that's what you do on, on a day-to-day -day level with the events of your life, making it, building it, make, making it make sense. Mm -hmm. I'm struck with what you, what you said earlier about going into the, the empty space spaces in Mitla, mm -hmm. which is, it seems well, to be a parallel, and the place that the, that the dreamer, that the king who was the dreamer went, needed to go to to bring out the, yeah. to bring out the, the uh, uh, well, the, the other interesting thing about mm -hmm. this, and this is why uh, uh, actually uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright is so fascinating to study for what he takes out of this stuff and how he <laughs> uses it and when he uses it, because he doesn't use it in the same way with each house. And, and what, when, if any, has anybody been to the archaeological site of Mitla? Have you? I've been there. Yeah. Well, um, you know, the, you know those, the palaces 
are, are actually very narrow. When you get inside of them, I think they're only like six or seven feet wide. And in fact, that is what they live in. That is where they sleep, is in those things, okay? So they're basically living in a 10, uh, 30 foot long tunnel. <laughs> yeah, okay. And um, if you ever go into rural uh, Mexican villages today, if you're invited to stop in for dinner, which, well, it happened to me the, the first time in 1976, I went home with a man. He uh, took me into his house. We turned left, saw his kitchen, and the whole rest of the house was dark. Okay, again, this is this kind of tubular experience in this, this house, long adobe house. Okay? So as I was sitting there with his wife, who was cooking up the food and, and, and everything, uh, I began to kind of notice that there was something at the other end of this room, but it was so dark I couldn't see. As my eyes got used to the light, I suddenly saw all of these little faces peering out at me, and it, and it looked like something from a pirate epic or something. It was the entire extended family, all strung up in hammocks of all different kinds, just sitting there staring at me, you know, and, and I was just, there must have been 15 or people or so stacked in there for the night, just listening to me go on and on and on with my, my friend about all of this. Well, that is how they are sleeping in those Mitla palaces. And um, the thing is that if that's true, then they're basically making this interior space entirely secondary to that court which, whose total function is first to produce wealth, that is where women weave, that is where the, 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 the men, we know that in this society the craftsmen or the elite themselves uh, are making all of this junk to, to trade and exchange like as bride wealth for, uh, uh, um, with each other, all in the context of this theatrical poetic recitation. So their entire lives are revolving around this quadrangular space that, that is, comes into its fullest activation with this kind of kind of material. I, I mean, that, that to me is, a, again, a striking example of how important this whole system of, of poetic recitation and the use of this material was to this society. Their whole lives are literally revolving around it as a space, whether it's activated during a banquet or whether it's inactive when they're weaving or doing other things. It, it, it's the implication of its context as a space is always there. <laughs> so like to get back uh, to, the, to the distinction you're making, David, in narrative yeah. and storytelling, and try to think of it in terms of this culture. You know, I, Which culture? The culture that we're living in in California. I, I, I say that because I, I'm not sure that your culture is my culture. There's a lot going on here, I think. Yeah, that's another well, discussion. Same way. People are speaking English. English. This is something we'll get into the discussion. But I, for instance, I, the way that you're talking about narrative, it sounds to me like you're talking about some kind of a, um, a core wish, which is not yet entangled with all the, the details that could be attached to it, and all the ways you could get to the wish. And you know, just to, to, to attach it to something fairly concrete, this past weekend, uh, I was in Santa Fe, and I went to see this church that I now, every time I go to Santa Fe, I go to see it in Chimayo. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the church in Chimayo is, uh, is supposed to have sacred dirt. And there's a sanctuario, which is part of the church, and you go into the sanctuario, and people leave various kinds of, of votive objects, everything from, from candles to portraits of Jesus, where the eyes move, you know, to little photographs of sick relatives, to dead relatives, and so on. And I, I, I find whenever I go there, I have the same split. On one hand, I'm revolted by the by the, I would say, the grossness of the, uh, the iconography, of a lot of the iconography. On the other hand, the, the impulse to be helped, the impulse to, have to, to feel that something is out there that may help you, is so powerful that I always want to go back. Mm -hmm. And I never, I mean, I don't see any way to put the two together, but it, I'm trying to bring back this, this idea of narrative and story. It seemed to me that, that the impulse, in this case, expressed through the sanctuary to, to be connected to something bigger than yourself or to be suffered by something bigger than yourself is the narrative in that situation. And the story is all the stuff that people bring to it from their individual lives. 
No, I, I can imagine reading it that way. I, 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 it doesn't. I mean, it, it's not in conflict with anything. I mean, anything I'm imagining. I hadn't thought of it from that point of view. No, I'm not trying to. No, no, I'm just. No, I'm just saying that. I mean, it seems. See, like my, my, I mean, it wouldn't be in conflict with it. But what I'm saying is that it seems to me that narrative. You know, narrative is, it seems to me is one of these universals. I mean, when I first started dealing with narrative, I talked to. I had it's a, lot a of big friends. buzzword it's in a big history buzzword. right now. Yeah. And I spoke to a lot of anthropologists, or I had a lot of anthropologist friends, yeah. and I spoke to them. And they always came up with these sort of sacred stories that were kind of obvious and institutional. And I wasn't interested in institutional narratives. In yeah. a certain sense, my, in, my sense is that institutional narratives are the co optation of the human universal that there's a human universal which is individual and universal at the same time. Because we're constructed very much like each other. That is, people in some ways are more alike than they're not. Uh, that is, uh, Australian Aborigines uh, and Chinese Mandarins and uh, you know, uh, American space, uh, space explorers have probably have more in common than they don't have in common, given their neurological construction and the way in which uh, the, the way in which the DNA works. I mean, in a real sense, we're built very similarly, and appetites are in many cases very cultural issues are very much there. But the fact is that narrative is pre-cultural, and I found the most anthropological belief of the relative relativism was a big deal in anthropology for a long time, mm -hmm. and I, it was a kind of cultural universal. It, it was it was an anthropological universal that everything was relative except relativ the relativism. And I didn't believe it. It seemed to me that there, you know, like I would ask these guys, I would say, like, you know, like, it's okay, you're telling me what the sacred story is. Forget the sacred story. The sacred story is how they've worked it out institutionally. They're, tell me what they say in their dirty jokes. When they're swapping, when they're swapping gossip in the village out in front, what are they saying? So we don't do that, they said. I said, well, why? You, you know, you guys went out there looking for sacred stories, and you got sacred stories. Yeah. Now tell me what they did when they were gossiping. Yeah. They said, we don't know. Yeah. So in effect, I found that a lot of this was not going to work to find it out directly. But, I did, but I've been thinking about narrative from the point of view that everybody has to deal with the recuperation of reality. That reality is a fracturing event. If our desires are fractured on the rocks of reality, our anxieties are thrown up to us in, in the reefs of reality. Uh, we're constantly being, you know, challenged. Like our belief systems are small. That is what we take as conventionally that we we understand the world is relatively narrow, and the world constantly surprises us, and we try to pretend it doesn't. So we work out systems for imagining that the world is more conventional than it is, and we wind, wind up pretending that everything is really there. You know, it's like you're standing in an, you're standing in the, in the you're in the, standing in the middle of the ocean, you know, on a craft that's sinking, and you try to imagine that you're in a main thoroughfare like the Champs Elysees, and you imagine it's all very stable, uh, and that's how we get by. But in our dreams, we can't get by that way because we're aware that the boat is rocking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the point is that the rocking boat wants to get somewhere, and you want to be somewhere, and you want to stay the same, and you want to be better or do something. Desire is central to human life. So my sense is that narrative is when you deal with all the things you shut out, you know, to get across the street. The street is like a great chasm. It opens up. <clears throat> you don't know where it's going to be, especially if you cross one of these big boulevards against traffic. It's like a great chasm. We know how to cross streets. We're good at it. We do it. We get home. We're terrified. But we don't want to be terrified while we're awake. We go to sleep. We get terrified. And then we deal with the terror of reality, the fact that <clears throat> at any moment the world can disintegrate. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems to me so that narrative is a human universal. It's that way for an Aboriginal in Australia. It's that way for the Mandarin. It's that way for the spaceman. <clears throat> but we conventionally don't do it. You know, mm -hmm. we don't do narrative because it does. It's like crazy. You know, you're not going to spend your life dealing with crisis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or you won't get across the street. So it's, this is my what I mean by the narr the narrative is then the attempt to come to terms with the fragmentation that reality forces upon our coherent minds. Our minds are simple and coherent. Reality is discoherent, and the minds have to grapple with the discoherency of reality. So the dream, or a narrative, is an attempt to make sense, some kind of complex sense, out of the complexity of the world, which isn't sensible. And so this is, for me, what narrative is. Yeah. Now, it seems to me that when they take it and the Aztecs do it, the reason the power these great cultures have among their elite groups that are into this thing is they take the individual universal, 
and they attach themselves to it. But they attach it for political reasons and in a kind of way that co-opts it. So its appeal is like the appeal, let's say, of the fascists, of, you know, or whatever. It's similar. They make a similar appeal, but they make an appeal to a human universal. And the human universal is there. So we can read the human universal in it, even if their uses of these institutional deals are, in fact, perverted versions of the full possibilities of narrative. Mm -hmm. See, my sense is the Greek standard systems and the Aztec standard systems are, in fact, somewhat perverted versions of our own narrative capabilities. Mm. Some more and some less so. Mm -hmm. Is that, does that make any sense to you? Well, when you <coughs> say uh, perverted, uh, uh, you mean in terms of its uh, uh, structure and form? Or no, in more per ideology? perverted in the sense of its ideological uh, oh. use as ideological underpinning. Yeah. A kind of political underpinning. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it becomes a kind of justification for something else. Yeah, I, I, I think its primary usage is, is in uh, elite encounters through uh, po poetry and theater, but it's been also applied to state administration yeah. and politics. Yeah. Which is what I meant by its inherent, the, the possibility of its perversion. But the, the sense yeah, of okay, like using right. narrative for self-salvation seems to me inevitable. That is, and we probably always do it. Yeah. That is probably there's no way to be alive without narrative. I would imagine yeah. that if I, one of the things that's interesting that sleep deprivation studies oh. that have demonstrated that you can wake people up a great deal and they may and they have, may have very little sleep and they'll do all right, but if you destroy their dream time, oh. they become nearly deranged. Uh -huh. Nearly. Well, completely. Depending, well, it depends how complete. <laughs> different accounts. But they become really quite deranged. Mm. And then it seems logical that we probably go to sleep not to rest, but in order to dream. Oh. And, the, and the dreaming is the, the, is the narrative act that restores our minds to its capability yeah. and its integral possibilities. Yeah. You would allow me just one second. I absolutely. Narrative is always secondary. We talk, 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 talk. And we think that that's primarily our life is emotional. We are aggressive, we are afraid, we are sad, we are happy. All our lives are emotional. Narrative is always secondary. We translate our emotion into talk through the medium of culture. If you would have lived 10,000 years ago, your dreams would have been identical because the emotion and the biological thing are the same. You would have been afraid identically like a man today, but the narrative, which is a translation of the emotion, would be different, which is a product of the culture, which is time and space in which you are. And that's what I want to do. Well, I don't think that's true. I mean, I'll tell you why, what I see, but I think you, we see what you're addressing is essentially the verbal representation of story. Story is culturally determined, and you're quite right, it has a verbal, verbal a kind of verbal fix, fix. But it seems to me that no dream is no dream exists independently of its narrative force. Narrative is in dreams that have there are very few words in it. That is, but there are cognitive identifications. Conceptual entities occur in dreams. The ability of the dreamer to recognize something as that thing, to recognize a horse as a horse, is already linguistic. That is, a horse is not a perceptual element, it's a cognitive perceptual mix. And that the conflict felt, the terror of being run down by a horse, or the pleasure of riding on a horse, is already a narrative idea, and you don't have to say anything to feel it. But nevertheless, you have to cognitively recognize it. So I'm not talking about narrative as storytelling. That's the one thing I'm not doing, talking about. I agree with you. Storytelling is secondary. But I've tried to divorce storytelling from narrative as the secondary event. So in that sense, I agree with you. You see what I mean? I, I'm arguing that narrative is really different. Narrative is, I, I'm, I've been describing narrative as the confrontation of a desiring subject with the threat or promise of transformation. This doesn't have to appear verbal. You are probably a writer. I am a writer, but, yeah, but, I you, don't have, but you don't have to write this. You can see it. What makes you think I'm a prisoner of it? I very seldom use it. I improvise verbally without writing. Well, it may be just that the term narrative is such a learned term that we're lacking for a word. Because I, I agree entirely with both of you, but I think you're talking about different things. We are talking about, yeah. we, we're say, what, you're, what I'm calling story, you're calling narrative. That's fine. I mean, just that I'm choosing to call something else narrative. Mm -hmm. 
which I think is more fundamental, and like you, I agree that it doesn't, inter doesn't depend upon words, it depends upon cognitions and perceptions and emotions, and I probably you can't separate them at all. But In fact, only verbally can we separate emotions from ideas. But about time, it's interesting that in dreams, there certainly is a sense of time, that things have a certain sequence in dreams. Yeah, but it's not, at all, really it's not at all the time that we experience in our coherent conscious minds. And in that sense, it's storytelling, is the avant-gardeism of the dream is that the dream uh, is uh, maybe uh, what you were talking about. It's all about these cruxes and these nodes where there's a threat and then something happens or doesn't happen, uh, desire is fulfilled or thwarted or whatever. And that occurs in time. But it occurs in a kind of experiential climactic time. And, and so dreams dreams are stories. I mean, a dream is a story. It isn't you know, told. Mm -hmm. It's movie story. It's storyboard. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. presentation or whatever you would call it. It's experience story. It's, it's a stage, yeah. it's theater, you know, it's your own theater of the mind. It's, yeah. it's a filmic experience, it's a cinematic experience. Yeah. Wouldn't well, you agree that your dreams, if you, you write know, them down, become narrative? You know exactly what dreams are. Dreams are also secondary. Dreams are always a replay of the emotion that we underwent during the day. It's a classical experiment. They took two groups of people, they taught them something new, specifically was mathematical formulas, and then they let them speak with electrodes attached to the brain. Those who started to dream were awakened and they were not allowed to dream at night. The next day, they gave both groups a test. Those who could dream could repeat the problem that they learned the day before. So those who were not allowed to dream could not solve the problems that they learned the day before. So we know what our brains do at night. They integrate the lessons learned during the day, during sleep. But that's like this Colombian picture, that's like the notes, it's like dance, it's like drama. It's not like words. Words are something that is very recent in human experience. Dreams are, are as ancient as the biological species is. So words are almost a curse. It depends on the language that you master. The How do you know that words are recent? I mean, I, I'm sure they're not. Us. It's a Look at the language of the animals. <laughs> They've got words. They don't, you know, they don't have as many words, and they don't have organs to develop like ours. They don't. They don't. <laughs> they, yeah, they do. But, but the words language. can be opened up through metaphor. That's why you have poetry and why you have metaphor. So. I, I just want to point out one thing. I mean, I, I mean it, it, certainly there are a lot of ways of approaching dreams. There is a journal of dream dreaming which has been worked on by scientists and literary figures and uh, psychologists. Nobody knows what dreams are. There are a lot of explanations of what dreams are, and you certainly are describing one particular explanation. On the other hand, it is quite probable that the same dreams that have deal with the rubble of yesterday are also contained material, as Freud demonstrated very clearly, have archaic material in them that you may have experienced 30 years ago, which also show up in dreams. So it's, they're not as simple as that, and they are not verbal or purely verbal, and they're not purely visual. In fact, it's hard sometimes to specify what actually one's experience was like when one tries to recuperate it, because we, never have, we only have dream memories. We don't really, nobody has direct access to anybody's dreams. We only have reports. So we're dealing like with the, the blind men with the elephant, you know, walking around the elephant trying to find out what it is. And we have more or less probable accounts of what dreams are like. But f as we share experiences of them, one thing we know is that some parts of a dream are not visual. Some parts of a dream are profoundly visual. Some are kinesthetic. Uh, like I, some people don't dream, some people dream in color, very intense color. Uh, that where the color means an enormous amount in the dream and can't be explained by any particular set of words. You know, you, you, I mean, I, I can think of a particular dream where the face, a blue face of a, of a bishop <laughs> against the white back, against the gold background, it was taking place in this dream. And it was like an illuminated book. Where I was like I was looking at an illuminated book. And I was hearing an over, a voiceover uh, <laughs> saying some preposterous thing about uh, the life of these people while I was looking at this intense blue face uh, against the, the gold background. And obviously its meaning had a lot to do with this rather weird, almost Byzantine look to this animated figure. 
I don't know what it, I mean, I certainly don't know what it meant, but, I, but it certainly wasn't clearly verbal. And so, it, I mean, in that sense, I don't know whether we were secondary or primary or tertiary. And, and dreams are not, I mean, they're not even always so visual. I mean, I have, I, I, I can re remember dreams which are perceptual, which are, are combinations of sensations that, 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 that I mean, you know, maybe linear or maybe non-linear, but they're, 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 they're outside, they're very much outside experience, but yet they're perceived, they're received. I mean, that's, uh, mm -hmm. well, I mean, this, uh, the, 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 the one of falling, the, you know, the feeling of oh, falling, yeah. which is well, one that we all get like. Yeah, but that, that, that initial, that, that place where you go into the dream state and all of a sudden, you know, your body goes through that, and that's usually, that's usually preceded by sense, uh, the this, this sensorial kind of impaction that happens. That I, I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's real rich that you're talking about this. I had never really thought about it exactly, exactly in a way, but even trying to make sense of it. Wow. There's a wonderful story in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. I'm sorry to bring up a Western European. What's wrong? Yeah, you know, but the nun's priest tale, where the rooster Chanticleer talks to his wife about his nightmare, and he goes through a whole typology of dreams, citing you know ancient Roman sources and all that about predictive dreams or dreams that come because you've eaten something that doesn't agree with you. And, I mean, and people have been fascinated by dreams for forever, and there are tribes, oral tribes, where children are telling their mothers what they have dreamt at night, and they are discussing the dreams. There are tribes in, um, in, in Borneo, is it? In, uh, where every morning, all the members of the community, of the family, come together, and over breakfast, the conversation is everybody telling each other what they dreamt that night. Mm -hmm. And then all those dreams are discussed, and the best dreams are reported to the head of the tribe. <laughs> 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 Is this, this is fascinating way that that infects reality in a way that, I, that, 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 that fascinates me, you know, bring, bringing, the, bringing the dance, bringing the song into the group, into the community, and then everyone performing. It reminds me in some way of the trial, of the Spanish trials, uh -huh. where the, 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 uh, uh, the codes are brought in as evidence. I mean, there's this, this interface of, 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 of two different memes, or two different... I don't even want to call them cultural realities. No, I don't. I, I lose the language. But it, it, it's a this interstice, this interstice between one way of perceiving reality and another, mm -hmm. you know, one culture and another. Yeah. Well, um, that that's what the the, the colonial period is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that that's why the colonial period is so fascinating to study because uh, b basically, I, I believe that that all cultures have or they, com they they have all of the same abilities they have the ability to create certain things in certain ways and they have the, the same ability to address practical problems government family society but they ideologically compartmentalize this differently so what you're basically looking at with the colonial period in in Mexico for example is two groups of people confronting each other trying to figure out each other's system of compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. So obviously when uh, the Spanish friars are trying to bring in uh, uh, you know, uh, festival reenactments, many of which had already been banned in Spain, but this is the only way they could get the Indians to participate in them, um, the, then the Indians bring their part to it, which is they start to take the, uh, well, I think they, they're basically taking the treatment, the story, uh, that the Spaniards are providing, mm -hmm. and, and sticking it on their landscape, so that then it becomes, then they can re, yeah. they can uh, bring it to life through their narratives, yeah. but they're basically just adapting the Spanish storyline. The version of Guadalupe. Yeah, exactly. Perfect yeah. example. Yeah. Uh, supposedly, uh, in their history, there's a woman that always appeared in that particular yeah. area yeah. for centuries, right. and she was not known to be much before the colonial period. It's this goddess, yeah, this earth the goddess, right. yeah. Yeah, and, and so it's interesting how they adapted that. Yeah. I just was told that just recently, and I thought, my, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, her name, I mean, the priests couldn't understand the words, and they called her Guadalupe, because yeah. Guadalupe was the closest thing to the 
Nahuatl or Quechua or whatever right. the man said. Sure. So they immediately project their own culture onto someone else's Always, culture yeah. and take the image of the goddess and make it the word. Always. Well, so they're, so they're, but I, I like this. I think this is an interesting exercise in employing David's uh, uh, separation between story and narrative. That, that the story is the treatment that the Spaniard brings to the table. And then the activation of it as a narrative in its indigenous context is what we're seeing with, like, the Virgin of Guadalupe story or something like that. Is that something you would? Yeah, yeah, I, think, yeah, I, yeah I would feel that way very much. I, I think the whole issue is we've, the whole issue, we've been told what stories are all along, and we have kind of whole, you know, set of, it's like you, you, everybody imagines them as plots, and like they write about narrative as if it were plot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's a way of approaching it. We've had, heard this from the beginning of time. There are, you know, considerable philosophical figures have addressed the issue of narrative. There are endless books on it. Uh, the most interesting of which I think may, might be someone like Paul Ricoeur, the French phenomenologist. And even he gets stuck in this image of plot. Mm -hmm. that the plot, because plot is inherently what we've been told stories are involved in. But actually, the avant-garde of the 20th century uh, produced many narrative pieces that are, in a certain sense, don't have that image of plot as the essential work. Whether you take a film by Cocteau, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, some of those Cocteau things, I'm not thinking of Beauty and the Beast, which is, but I mean, if you, if you take, you know, surrealist films, you often find narrativity there, but you don't find... You know, like Lodge you Lord and all those things. Yeah. Yeah. But you and don't have to wait for the 20th century. I mean, my point is that everything that we're talking about here, which is so interesting, is that we see these oppositions between the East and the West, or you know, our mm -hmm. verbal culture, and what you, what you end up realizing in the end is that all this stuff is going on in all cultures all the time. Yeah. The cultures you think are oral, they have mnemonic systems of writing. Yeah. The cultures, in your, you know, and uh, Tristram Shandy, a novel that has absolutely no plot, you know, written in the 18th century. Well, it has one plot, and it's, he's waiting to get born, uh, well, which I he never gets. He never, gets uh, he never well, arrives at getting that's born. That's not a plot. I'm sorry. <laughs> he's waiting to be born. It's a narrative, right? It's a narrative, <laughs> it's a narrative with digressions without a plot. You're right. You're right. You're right. No, no, the reason I mentioned the 20th century is in a certain sense it was the, the end of the 19th and the 20th century in the West that discovered there was something else. Uh -huh. That there was always there, but they discovered the fact that it was, that it was there, that there was an insufficiency in the way Western European culture had in fact represented itself. And in fact, it's the period of the great ethnography and the looking outside and the looking to the vernacular traditions, the folk traditions, all of which comes up, I guess, between about 18, uh, the 1880s and, uh, and, and 1914. Uh, you, you find the great explorations beginning in what we call the avant-garde, along with the development of iconography and anthropology, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of ethno ethnography, I meant, and, uh, and anthropology, which developed in the same space. Mm -hmm. That the Musée de l'Homme uh, in Paris was, in a certain sense, a construction of very literary figures. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. very literary anthropologists, because they were basically part of an avant-garde, part of a surrealist avant-garde. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there is a close connection between the Dada and surrealist avant-garde. I mean, someone like Tristan Sara or someone like Blaise Sandrard were among the first people to produce translations, powerful translations of African poetry uh, in the West. I mean, they. Uh, uh, Sandra published a book called Poesie Negre, and uh, Sara actually worked off uh, various French translations of, uh, of African uh, po tribal poetry. And uh, you have the great uh, ethnographers conducting their work among the American Indians, all about this, and the uh, Australian Aborigines uh, that were being conducted by various people in Australia almost at the same moment. Mm -hmm. There was this great opening of things between about 1890 and 1914. So that I, that's what I meant by the avant-garde connection, why I take it. It's a kind of pivot point to look back beyond the self-representation of the West as this rather special deal. And right, so, in fact, they broke it open. I mean, didn't they also look to children's art and to the art of the Madness, United? children's art, women's <laughs> traditions, uh, yeah. all the you know, drunkards, all the things that were shut out of the idealized classical version. Women, drunks, uh, yeah, women, right. drunks, children, madmen, and little brown people. <laughs> <laughs>
for large brown people. <laughs> a lot of brown too. And, and, and reddish and yellowish That's people. Right. Well, well <laughs> yeah, I, I was still amazed at these uh, book catalogs that come in the mail, and I read like uh, sexual deviance among Zapotec women and, and all of these things. <laughs> I your pardon? Yeah, I'm just kind of like, my God, are people still writing about this oh, stuff? Yeah. And, well, they're reprinting them. That's what they do. Well, uh, gee, this is new stuff. Uh -huh. You know, I see these guys are on Oaxaca City and everything, and it's like, wow. You know, like, <laughs> Not only is it the end of the century, it's the end of the millennium, but keep your sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to take a, a short break and get some tea and coffee and then reform? Can we do that? Just take a five minute break? Yeah. <laughs> see, is there any, are there any, is there anybody in the audience at this point that's got questions or points that should maybe open it up just a little bit, a little bit more? Any thoughts that this is raising uh, uh, um, with, with, with anyone, anyone, any questions? Or assertions. I, why questions only? Yeah. Commentary. Yeah. Observation. An assertion. Okay. Um, well, I, I'd like to lend credence to your argument about the pressure of narrative in uh, human mind and evolution. There are certain people who suffer really bad traumas, be it in war, or sexual abuse, etc., who, for one reason or another, cultural or otherwise, have to repress um, feelings or narratives at that time, and they get so badly symptomatic because they can't um, essentially express these narratives. Um, I don't know whether they actually don't dream about them at the time. That I have no idea about. But later something re-triggers them and they have a flood of dreams. And it seems the only thing that makes them better is to actually re-experience the narrative. Um, in what way? Actually telling the whole story of what mm -hmm. happened. And it usually has to be with an empathic listener. In other words, somebody who they believe, the, the, the teller mm -hmm. believes, understands the narrative. Um, and it's not like it's one time, but the whole narrative is played out and they actually feel better um, and get much less symptomatic in terms of recurrent nightmares, recurrent thoughts, terrible anxiety, autonomic symptoms, elevated blood pressure, et etc. et cetera. And I think it's interesting that it's sort of built-in pressure to release these narratives. You, you get, you feel better, even on a daily basis, let's say, just usual anxieties, if you're allowed to express the narrative, whether in dreams or whether actually in just the telling. And, um, and I think if you don't, if you're not allowed to, it, it causes a lot of problems, mm -hmm. biological problems. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the thing that strikes me about all this your crux, right? For your for you're your not, your node. Your node, yeah. I mean and and then, you know, I lived in the Middle East and then when I came back here I had to study folklore and mythology. I had to mm -hmm. connect with certain type of images and um, I don't know, it's pretty basic, but it so tonight when I heard you, it just kind of confirmed I was thinking about the you know the dream images and it was really a strong experience for me. Well, in a sense, I mean, like what you're, you know, what you're suggesting is essentially what many of us did when we were trying at one point to write an image poetry that wasn't syntactically interesting, but was 
basically a series of crossing nodes of images of that would mean things, but they would sort of like, they wouldn't mean things. The meaning would be, would be secondary, in, in, in a sense, that the meaning would be secondary, but that the images would be intersections of feeling, uh, perceptions and feeling put together uh, so that we could handle it directly without recourse to explanation. There was a whole period where yeah. a number of us were trying to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, called it, the, it was called an image school of poetry, which had certain real limitations after a while. But a lot of us tried to work this way. Uh, we tried to find the way to deal with things independently of the conventional formulations. Mm -hmm. So I mean, these kind of cruxes. I mean, so if your horse or your your bison, as it were, running across its Paleolithic cave, uh, is uh, is an image for you. Uh, it's right. not surprising. It's like a dream image. I yeah, mean, but then and then the next thing was, you know, I'm talking to someone that's telling me about the, uh, the, the Plato's dialogue with the, with the black and the white horse and the charioteer. Not, I can't the name. Yeah, yeah, it's in the Republic. Okay, it starts with a T. And um, and then I started thinking. So then I had to put all the words to, you know, historically, like documents. I'm starting to get into that, but, you know, the documentation and the art historical perspective of it, but that bothers me a little now, you know, after hearing all this stuff. I like just the, the straight approach, this could be really good. That's, I guess that's an art, the artist approach, of just the images more than the, I don't know. Anyway, it's very interesting tonight. Well, the, 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 it, when, you, when you first started talking, the, the artist is process just the images. I mean, you, you talk about a, of this horse in your dream, and in a sense, what it calls up to me is the idea of these, these images being that, that the images in the dream are not just problem solving, but they're actually generative. That, yeah. that, 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 that holding this, this, this node actually generates, can generate multiple stratas of activity or, or yeah. a, 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 a investigation, uh, right. uh, a matrix. It can actually generate a matrix. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amazing. So, so my, my personal inclination is always to try to say, well, what, is, what are we going to do with this now? You know, now that we've mm -hmm. had this discussion or that, that I'm thinking about mm -hmm. this now. And, and it, it seems to me that, that uh, finding a way to, first of all, to, to maintain contact with the dream or with the narrative or with the wish, you know, and, but even more importantly, finding a way to then integrate that with with the messy part, and sometimes they're in the repetitive part of living, which may be the story, is the daily problem. Mm -hmm. Because as, as you said, you know, you have to figure out a way to cross the street. And if you start dreaming when you cross the street, you may not get to the other side. And so you're always, you know, within this problem and, and thinking too that 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 children, there's a there's a mm -hmm. space for children to actively um, enact these problems through play, mm -hmm. you know, so that if, um, I've always felt that ch children playing with blocks was in a sense, is in a sense the, uh, the narrative for what the school is about. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 the, it's the experience that, that begins that, that, mm -hmm. that problem, the touch, maybe the touchstone experience of putting things together to make something out of nothing. And, and, uh, and also in a sense it's the messy stuff. I mean, who's to say, say that it's not more important? The messy stuff is not more important than crossing the street. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the, I think we've got to kind of balance those, those. You know, it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting mm -hmm. that uh, when you mentioned play, that Melanie Klein uh, of the, you know, uh, the post <laughs> oh, 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 Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> After getting rear-ended, <laughs> you went over the edge. Uh, Wes, why don't you come closer? Yeah, I'm coming in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, what, I, what I was thinking was that that's the problem. Like, you know, what happens when you're concentrating on meaningful things in the screen and you fall off the, you fall off the podium? Oh. <laughs> but but the, 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 the interesting thing about, it's interesting sometimes to reconsider some of the, 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 the psychoanalytic tradition from the outside, because you see, I think you see them better. Melanie Klein actually treated play of children as if she was dealing with dreams. Mm. No. Mm. I mean, inherently, 
The supposition was that these were dreamlike structures that they created. And there's something interesting in that idea itself that dreamlike structures are like play, or play is like dreamlike structuring, or it's like poetic construction. Mm -hmm. I mean, that there are elements of the manipulation of imagery in a free manner. Like, the, like the, she used to give these kids, I believe they used to use little animals and props and things a lot that, that she mentioned at various times with them. I think you had an experience with a climb like Alice Ellie when you were a kid, didn't you, where they gave you things to play with? Uh, and I think that they, um, that they didn't have the stories. Mm -hmm. They assumed that the meaning of these things would be elicited from watching these images placed in positions and then transposed. I don't quite understand you. They'll come, come in she had bit. kids who uh -huh. were disturbed for some reason or other, and therefore mm -hmm. otherwise it wouldn't have been brought to so her. So they didn't have they, stories. I mean, they were problematic. Kid, these were very young children, and it, it wasn't that they would tell the story of their life. The talking therapy mm -hmm. was not the best mm -hmm. deal. So what they did is they would try to get the kids to play. Mm -hmm. They'd give the kids things to play with that might be objects that could be used by them as poetic cruxes mm -hmm. to deal with. And mm -hmm. they were like either household objects, objects, animals, sense, objects, yeah, okay. and whatever. And the things the kids would select would have a kind of meaning. Mm -hmm. And the constellation of things they would suggest, select would have more meaning because of the juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I think that they, that the, knowing the Freudians, they were rather pedestrian in the objects they put in front of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, you could imagine a thimble and a horse, and a, you know, a thimble, a horse, and uh, you know, a pillow. Uh, could be rather free, probably freer than they would have done. But the point is that, that whatever it is, you would imagine they would have built kind of object poems, mm -hmm. what Breton used to call mm -hmm. poem objects. And is that, is, yeah, is that is how close is that to the to the codices? How how close is that to the idea of the codices? The whole idea. Well, of I, po they, they've never poems. been thought about in that mm -hmm. kind of an idea. That 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 is actually what. Uh, well, in fact, an idea I have is that these codices and this pictographic writing doesn't come out of any earlier tradition of writing whatsoever. I think it comes out of base painting, because that's mm -hmm. the critical thing. That it's the feast, the drink, the providing of wealth and mm -hmm. gen so-called generosity, which means they all got to pay you back at some point. <laughs> but um, and, and around mm -hmm. these bases, mm -hmm. and it's from there that they've taken. The, 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 the state of the, the theater at the banquet into codifying it, making mm -hmm. it valid by turning it into a book, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. a book that can still be used right. in, in the context of a banquet as a that story. That has book. a narrative because it's linear. But is yeah, it a book on the walls? Yeah. Is it a and book on the walls? It's hung up on a wall. Yeah. So, so in a sense, you go from the from the vase, from the vase, which is the object, yeah. and then the story is blown out to the walls. Yeah. Is that the way so it happens? So you have the complete. Story, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it might be combinatorial rather than than, than story-like in the sense that you might be you, you, like the, the construction of the codices might be like taking a, taking a cast of characters mm -hmm. and combining them. Yeah, uh -huh. you know what I mean. Yeah. You, like take you know take one king, mm -hmm. <laughs> take one king, one yeah. eagle, yeah. Uh, you know, and a lake. Yeah, and what have you got? You got three characters. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. that's what actually appears on their bases. Yeah, and then and then they. But is that is that a summary of the story? Is that would is that a well? It might be the genesis of the of, genesis of, 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 of the story. narrative. Mm -hmm. I mean, like imagine a king, a lake, and oh, a, oh right, you right. know, a, a king, a lake, and, son, and an eagle. Uh, Oh, 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 I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what I'm imagining is what you're doing is you're taking the core cast. elements. The core elements. Yeah, you got the king, the lake, and the eagle. Go yeah. with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. What is yeah, yeah, yeah. Bringing in the dancing maidens. Which would be a poetry <laughs> exercise, right? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. What, and what are some of the elements on the codices? If you, if you, you were going to call out king, lake, whatever the other thing is, that you potato. I have an eagle, but yeah, yeah. What, what, what are some of the the figures that you're able to 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 understand the symbols on the in the in the whole codex. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well, there they, they, they've turned it into dynastic information. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's marriages, children. Mm -hmm. Children often make war, mm -hmm. kill off a rival, mm -hmm. marry all of his daughters, have more children. So, but it's people, so it's, it's all people. It's people, yeah. It's people, and how do you understand the relationships? Yeah, and it, and people and king lists. Uh huh, and, uh huh. And descent. And there's no objects whatsoever. No. No, no objects other than people. I mean, it's well, yeah, they all have these weird names that are uh -huh. calendar sign names. Uh -huh. that, okay. Uh, uh, it's kind of it's like the Egyptian idea, really, isn't it? I mean, pretty much. I mean, it's, it's, are these, well, it's picture writing, but but you know, but it, are it, these these look like they're gods? Yeah. They're not. They're not. They're illustrations. They're illustrations. Yeah. But they're they're the gods. They're, these aren't the um, the actual. Is there a, a like a documentation? 
Yeah, yeah that's, that's what the codex is. Oh, that's is. what the yeah. codex is. So the Egyptian hieroglyphics are not really picture writing. They're a mixture of phonological yeah. constructions and with determinatives. So it's not exactly. I wasn't thinking of the picture writing. Oh, the are you? Hieroglyphics. I was just yeah. thinking oh. of the different. Uh, and they don't even have base painting there. I was thinking yeah. of narratives. Mm. I was trying to understand the kind of narrative here. Mm -hmm. uh, these these look like they're god figures going through the. Are they god figures? Uh, well, uh, basically, they're uh, fragments of scenes from codices, but actually it's interesting, it's just as uh, David was pointing out, it's just elements of key scenes in a codex. It's not, it's, there's no story on the base yeah. itself, mm -hmm. which I always thought was because it was just trying to do a summary statement from the codex. What David is suggesting to me, why don't you try looking at the codex as being derived from a few key elements that were originally painted and on the, the base. Mm -hmm. yeah. Key elements, yeah. yeah. I just Here are your three elements, go with it. And from that, this guy comes up with this, this dream recitation or whatever you want to call it, which then becomes the format for codifying some of, the, some of it into a narrative. But are, is it hmm. possible that these narratives are stories that everybody already knew? And yeah, they, and knew the like moral. The stations of the cross, you know, where yeah. there's a picture where, you know, and, and everybody knows the whole narrative. Or what story, David's referring to as the story, yeah. 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 No, it's true, it's possible. Well, you don't know. I mean, it, 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 one of the things is if they're not fixed, I mean, consider that the, you've considered that the four Gospels don't tell the story the same way. You know, you've got basically, they've got different stories for crux events. Crux event is a, a kind of figure who is sort of God and human at the same time winds up being crucified. His, his, being, his being human allows him to be crucified. His being a god suggests that this is a bizarre opera, bizarre thing to have happened to him. Uh, but, well, of course it's bizarre, because in, in the Near East, when you have a god, one doesn't imagine a god being humiliated in this manner. Mm -hmm. So in fact, it's a paradox. It's positioned as a paradox. So you've got the crucifixion as a paradox. You have many other paradoxes. You have this powerful figure washing the feet of someone much less powerful. In other words, there are a series of paradoxes inscribed in the, in, the, um, in, in the various Gospels, which are distributed. Not all of them are in the same, not all of them, one, no one of them has all of them that the other ones have, but most of, the other, most of them are there. And there are many other Gospels that are not among the authorized version uh, that have other stories that are not canonical, but are also part of it. Uh, and, but crack, Crux elements remain the same. Miraculous births, uh, wisdoms of particular order, aphorisms, uh, political maneuvers. A variety of these things will all show up in the Gospels, but they won't show up in the same manner. Mm -hmm. So you've got four different stories and basically one narrative. Mm -hmm. And do the, and the same, the do the same the stories and these same elements show up in the, in the codices? And, well, each codex tells a different version of the same story, which is exactly what he's talking about. And our, and our, our feeling about mm -hmm. this, because some of this continued into colonial times, is that it's different royal houses mm -hmm. presenting their version of what uh -huh. happened. Uh -huh. uh, this is all in one book? No, these, there, there are uh, oh, there are many eight, codices. Eight, eight that are pre-Columbian in style, yeah. and then we have all of these lienzos that okay, they you know, took I, that style, yeah. continue to draw.